So now we've got John Soden and Carrie MacArthur. John is a professional wetland scientist at Natural Systems Design, an environmental engineering firm located in Bellingham, Seattle, and Port Angeles that specializes in the restoration of rivers, shorelines, and wetlands. John will be participating in Around the Woods, that's what we're about to hear, lessons learned from the wetland restoration projects, discussion with a focus on riparian planting and restoration in riverine and floodplain systems. And Carrie is a certified professional wetland scientist and certified ecological restoration practitioner with 26 years of experience. She successfully completed numerous critical areas monitoring projects involving site investigations, mitigation design, <coughs> development of corrective actions and adaptive management measures to meet permit requirements and preparation of annual and final reports. In her mitigation design work, Carrie evaluates a site and develops a wetland restoration design that uses the landscape and ecology to maximize project success. Well, thank you. Um, thanks everybody for this great conference. It's odd to have a conference. I'm really glad we did this. Uh, and uh, thanks to my session partner, Carrie. Uh, I'll be going first here. Uh, I'm, we just have a, a couple of quick slideshows. We have a half an hour and what this really is, is kind of a discussion forum but we each put together you know, eight or nine slides just to get the juices flowing. So I'm gonna open up with some kind of design into construction lessons learned from the past couple of years. And then Carrie's gonna take over and talk about more about kind of long-term site maintenance. And we'll close off the PowerPoint and uh, get into our discussion. So here we go, thank you. Um, let's do that. Uh, starting off, <clears throat> you know, so, We've all been talking about you know, what makes a successful uh, planting project uh, today. So we assume you know, before you get out there and do the planting that we've done all our homework, we're experts. Um, but what I wanted to talk about today is just something that uh, has time and time again uh, helped and that's designing some flexibility so that once you get out to the site and you see things aren't quite the way you thought they were, you, you actually have uh, the species uh, flexibility to um, make changes on the fly. Um, just the picture in front of you is a clustered planting approach. You know, we also do grids. One of the things I just wanted to recommend, and I'm sure folks do this, is whether in your grids, make sure you have a, a variety of plants for, you know, adapted to different soil moistures. Um, once you get out there, uh, you can then move your plants within your one polygon. Uh, just to take advantage of different site conditions. Um, we we're also looking at uh, the clustering and coming up with just a, a wet and a dry cluster type. And again, it's a little easier once you get out there to make those adjustments, move a cluster 20 feet this way to take care of a wetter, uh, take uh, advantage of a wetter area or a drier area. Um, the past couple of years, we just found this, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you just don't stand out there in trouble, let me put it that way. So you have your black and white plans, you, uh, you have your specs in the truck and you and the planting contractor are staring at each other and you might be the contract officer or you might be the, the designer, um, but it, it's go time. And the, they're looking for, to you for instruction or they may not be. This is the time you really wanna gauge that, that planting contractor's level of expertise. It could be that they're just a couple of folks from the construction contractor they're the last ones out there and they're supposed to put plants in the ground. You know that you have basically the next few weeks of your life, you're gonna be working hard. And they could also be a, a specialty uh, planting contractor. And they're gonna show you right from the beginning with their layout, their staking, the way they handle their plants and address the site that they're ready to go. It gives you a good idea of uh, how much time you're gonna to need to spend on site. And if you're a contracting officer, how much time you're gonna need your, your planting designer to, to give you that support. One of the things I always uh, uh, try to get done is inspecting plant materials. You know, once they're off the truck, and especially if they're in the ground, they're yours. Uh, but really once they're on the truck, they're yours. I really like to go to the nursery itself with your planting contractor and just inspect that material. You know, you're looking for root brown bound material, stuff that's obviously been sitting there for a while and the nursery might be wanting to get, a, uh, get rid of. Uh, but Again, once that truck's on site, that material is yours, and that's where you got to start. <clears throat> Another piece, you know, post construction. Uh, let's say you're does you know grading in a floodplain, and you have your wetland uh, creation site or enhancement site. Well, oftentimes that construction contractor could be gone off the site for several weeks, 
and things just aren't quite what you thought they would be uh, when your planting contractors uh, show up. So again, you know, from the beginning, designing flexibility once you get to that site is, is super important. Just this picture in front of you, you know, big patches of reed canary are left, grass are left in some areas, some areas are not. Obviously the soil has been turned over and over and over. So it was a good time for us, uh, uh, you know, as basically working with the planting contractor to decide, all right, let's go find our, you know, our best and biggest willow stakes and get those down into the reed canary grass. We'll put our, you know, our smaller stakes up uh, in, into the, the kind of the disturbed soil area. Can we move some of our drier species over here and some of our winter species over there? But basically just being ready and having that flexibility to uh, plant on the fly once you get there. You know, another thing that uh, we've been trying to take advantage of is while the construction contractor is still on site is taking advantage of big yellow machinery. Um, oftentimes when you're in the middle of constructing log jams or bank stabilization projects or, or wetland areas, you're in the middle of the, the dry heat, it's not the best time to collect plant material. It's definitely not the best time to plant material. Uh, but take advantage of the yellow equipment. Uh, and here you see a couple stinger attachments. Um, this has been working really well when you have kind of nice larger container stock. You can plant it down to depth, uh, get those roots in the, the low summer water table. And this material we've found just really survives well. Um, I've also seen stingers, kind of hand stingers with a water jet as well. So you can, you can use augers, but anything that can uh, get your plant material down to depth in these floodplain and wetland environments, uh, just uh, critical. Again, I'm, I'm throwing these ideas out there. You know, I really want folks when we get to the, the kind of session, just Let's, let's throw ideas in. This isn't comprehensive. This is sort of a scatter shot. Um, another, another aspect of especially planting in riverine environments, I think we've all seen it where you, you have your nice planting, you've, you're done planting, you might come out the next year and you've seen wood debris, you know, basically rip across your floodplain and, and break plants, uh, rip up plants. Uh, we've seen, you know, floods basically pop plants out of the ground and take them away. Um, one of the things that uh, we find effective is, and they've been used in a variety of uh, circumstances, especially on the west side, is, are these flood fences. Uh, and they're basically, you know, logs uh, augered or uh, driven into the ground in a fence array to catch debris. You can also use, you know, live cottonwood poles, uh, but just, uh, you know, any sort of big woody material that can withstand some impact from those flood, flood debris. You know, another aspect that we've implemented, you see a couple here on the left, you're, you're thinking of, you know, rivering environments where you have moderate velocities and willow stakes or especially one gallon containers, you know, stay away from one gallon containers will just be ripped away. The upper left is a fessel fabric encapsulated soil lift. Um, it, I've seen them work really well and the material do really well and hold together, but they are really expensive. Um, you need big yellow equipment on site to make those lifts. They're, they're labor extensive, but in the right situation, they'll work. You know, what I like a little better uh, is really just adding that wood and that roughness on the picture on the, on the right, you know, providing that protection, providing some kind of you know, breaking up that sheet flow across your site uh, and just, you know, driving some piles and uh, anchoring some wood debris or driving some, you know, logs with root wad into your floodplain can really make a difference on those velocities and just that the kind of the, the micro climates across your site as well as things start growing. Another one, and uh, I, we touched on this earlier, never forget about your sedge mats. Um, this is just a, a site where it was a deeply incised creek on the left. Um, and it was, this is a Bureau of Reclamation project actually. And so they came in and they had these weirs stepped up, which is, which is fine, it treated the incision. But our job was to come in on, on the planting side and we essentially uh, live uh, willow mats and stake them with live willow stakes. Um, really easy way to cover up bare ground right after the project. And as you can see, I believe this is about a year and a half later uh, it just, you know, the bank is looking great. And now went back, took a picture of this, which I couldn't find on my hard drive uh, a couple years ago, and it's completely overgrown by willows. So 
Um, those sedge mats and willow stakes have been fantastic. Um, essentially, I wanted to get to kind of and give Carrie enough time here, some thoughts and typical problems. The cows are coming. It's basically what happens when you get off the site? Is the landowner going to go back to running cows? Do the fences come down? Uh, who's going to, you know, as a private property, who's going to do the maintenance? Figuring out those things before before everyone leaves. Um, beef's, uh, you know, readily aware. This gets us into a lot of trouble. You have a plan set and you have your book specifications. And when you have references between the two, you can very easily make mistakes and that adds to confusion. And it often gives the planting contractor the right to say, hmm, well, this isn't right. Uh, and it just sets yourself up for trouble. Another point uh, that was made by a colleague as well is we're often, you know, specking plant material to be collected or grown uh, from the local watershed. That sounds great, but what we're also finding is that usually means the contractor just goes to the local nursery in the local watershed and who knows where that plant material came from. So that just requires a little bit extra leg work uh, to track that down, uh, to make sure you're getting plant material that's collected uh, locally. And obviously quite a bit of planning, you know, give yourself 18 months of propagation uh, before some of these planting projects, if that's one of your requirements. Um, and with that quick eight slides, just to get your brains going late in the afternoon, and maybe you need a cup of coffee. Uh, I wanna turn it over to Carrie, who's going to take it and um, dive into the uh, kind of the long-term maintenance side of things. Carrie, do you want to grab the screen? All right. Um, so thanks, John, and thanks everyone for having me here today. Um, yeah, I just wanted to go through some quick slides and get people thinking about kind of uh, the maintenance aspect of riparian uh, restoration. Um, we, I usually have the, the maintenance broken out into kind of two periods. The, the first period is usually what I would call kind of the short-term period, five to ten years. That's usually associated with your permit and or grant requirements. And then what do you do after that, um, after that period? So post-permitting grant requirements, um, stu you know, thinking of ideas, stewardship is a good um, idea for that long-term management since a lot of um, funding goes away when your permits are, are done. Um, but I'm definitely open to some long-term management ideas. Um, I know there's been some, some chatter amongst at least my coworkers about what to do for long-term um, management and maintenance of these of sites. So I'm um, hoping I can pick your brains to come up with some great ideas. Um, some maintenance challenges are to water or not to water or how much to water. Um, watering too much could help the, your uh, invasive species grow and be really happy, like the reed canary grass on the left. And not watering could cause your installed plants to dry out. So, you know, looking for ideas on and trying to figure out your, your site and when to water, not just if to water, but times of year to water. Um, some other maintenance challenges of our, our pesky plants. We both have both invasive and native plants that um, can choke out your, your uh, installed plants here. And so um, how best to treat those, you know, whether you do it, how much money is spent kind of in the, the beginning, the construction part of it versus the long-term maintenance. And there's usually some some benefits to either one. I found that if, because you usually get grant funding for construction um, and, the, and the kind of that short-term maintenance of it during your permit session, the more kind of weeding and maintenance you can do in those time periods, um, the better off you'll be later on in those later years. Um, let's see, some other challenges are our critters. Um, I am looking for some help on some deer browsing on those mature long-term plants, if anyone has <laughs> some suggestions. And I know um, ecology has been, at least recently, I've noticed that they're trying to get away from using those kind of plastic tubes around individual plants for um, beaver and deer browsing and more in fencing larger areas off. 
Um, how big of that area is, I don't know, has, hasn't really been explored all that much, but using kind of a wire fencing and not plastic fencing seems to be um, at least ecologies trending towards that, that way. I've had a few mitigation projects now where they've actually requested to not use those plastic tubes and to put in some sort of like chicken wire, hog wire fencing around, not necessarily the whole mitigation area, but um, just like planting areas, just to help some of the plants and recognizing that others might very well get um, browsed. And we have people, pesky people who dump stuff into our mitigation areas because it's a nice clean, or we've even had some areas where um, the road crew has come through and weed whacked down mitigation plantings, <laughs> which is a little frustrating. Um, so thinking about how people might be using your site or um, accessing your site is a good idea to help um, maybe help thwart some of these um, challenges that human disturbance causes. And that was really my, my three big things were the pesky plants, the pesky people and watering as my long-term maintenance kind of buckets of considerations to think about. And hopefully you guys can have some great ideas. There was the topic of plastic protectors came up earlier in the day and there was a lot of back and forth about that. So that might be a worthy topic of discussion. Um, also, there are just a couple of um, Simple questions in the chat. Uh, what is a sedge mat and where do you purchase them? Yeah, yeah, sedge mats are great. Um, we've been getting ours from actually uh, North Fork native plants that are out of Idaho. Uh, and they will deliver your sedge. You, basically you can spec the types of sedges you want them to grow and then they'll deliver your sedge mats, you know, rolled up and ready to go in sections that are fairly easy to handle. It's not cheap but uh, it's you know, easy to get on the ground, stake in, and boy, they, they really take off. So that was North Fork native plants. Not, I don't work for them. I don't, <laughs> no kickbacks here, but they're good folks to work with. And I would say, John, do you think, I mean, you know, I know you just said that they were a little more expensive, but by the time you add in kind of like erosion control for those banks and then just your standard seed mix and all that combined thing, is it, does it work out to be Still Somewhere. more expensive. No. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, right. just the, the labor and the shipping and all that kind of stuff. But um, every time I've used them in kind of lower velocity string banking, you mm -hmm. know, just trying to stabilize some string bank, they've worked well. I've also used, which is even cheaper, just, and someone brought it up earlier, just sod salvage, um, especially mm -hmm. if you're doing a little bit of digging, putting in a log jam and you're digging up some nice sod and just keeping that wet and replacing it um, when you're done. That's, that's worked really well. So there are a couple of questions about fencing. Um, mm -hmm. One is, have you used flood fencing to reduce sediment deposition on your plants? From that's a good question. You know, um, I have seen where that's been used uh, in many places to kind of um, kind of collect uh, cobble gravel and sort of close off areas you don't want water going. But in, in these applications, it's, it's truly just to rack debris and not necessarily um, you know, you know, slow down velocities to, you know, create sediment deposition. Um, that way, I think in my mind, that's a benefit, but it's not the, the true intent. The other question about fences or the comments have been that folks have used galvanized wire fencing. Mm -hmm. um, what is galvanized wire fencing? Well, it's not a flood fence, but <laughs> I'm looking at is that just like a hog, Is that just like hog wire fencing? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. It's just with galvanized um, metal so it doesn't rust. But I think most kind of fencing, metal fencing is some sort of galvanized or uh, some sort of coating on the metal so they don't rust. You know, and, and then I'd say, can we get away from the blue uh, browse protectors? right? Yeah. Um, that's a good way when you're driving around to see a new uh, riparian restoration site and you can stop the car and take a look. But, you know, what can we do besides blue browse protectors? Come on, we have 168 I, experts here. I, 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 yeah. Um, I had a comment. Yeah. 
Hello? I'm sorry. Um, this is Brian Combs. I'm on my phone, so I'm not sure how to raise my hand on the chat. Um, regarding the browse protectors, I've been talking to a lot of people about this recently, and we, we, we all want to get away from them. Um, I find one of the main reasons to use them is to protect against voles mm. and specifically in the, uh, the large pasture and agricultural lands that many of us are trying to work on, on reforesting. Um, I have seen over uh, the last, you know, 15 years or so, um, large, you know, I've seen multiple examples of large sites that have essentially gone into complete failure due to vole predation. So for me, that's the number one reason to use them. Um, they do help a little tiny bit with deer, although I'm having a lot of problems with deer as well. And I'd love to talk more offline with folks about fencing options for deer. So if we can, if we can fence the deer out, let's say hypothetically, then we're down to the vole uh, issue. Um, but again, um, I'm not at the point yet where I want to be responsible for a 20 acre site and not use the tree protectors and essentially be responsible for a massive failure. So um, I'm, I'm open to comments on it. Thank you. I'll second that comment about voles. I've seen the same thing um, as they girdle, you know, they can go around and girdle all, all of your woody plantings. Um, that's spot on. Yeah, I would say for deer browse, we've had, I've had some success of using like the cougar urine or coyote urine spray. I don't know if there's, but there's not like an eagle or a hawk or some sort of like vole rep, you know, <laughs> predator. <laughs> Just predator. sit out there with a yeah. shotgun. Yeah. <clears throat> right. Yeah, we, we use the plant skid, which is um, pig's blood. Okay. to keep the elk off of our plants and we did a study and it reduced browse by like 80 percent and that's also what we're using on the site we're doing for you carrie and it seems oh, nice. to have really okay. kept the deer down yeah one question is what about seedling release in tall grass pasture plantings or reed canary grass yep <laughs> 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 yep, that's a problem. Um, I have one site where um, it's a reed canary pasture next door. And we actually just went to the neighbor. Um, they used to have cows on their property. They don't anymore. And we just said, can we mow your reed canary grass? Mm. To at least keep the seeds from releasing. And she was like, sure. Mm. So we just, I, and we don't mow a whole lot. We mow like a, um, a 25 foot width strip neck, around our mitigation area. I mean, it, it's not perfect, but it, I think it helps. And then we, we planted um, kind of extra dense willow stakes along that edge too, in hopes of getting those things growing up faster and just kind of providing like making kind of like a wind break as well for the rest of the site. Um, this is a brand new site. It's only a year old, so I don't know if it's gonna, if these plans are working, going to work or not. But we'll see. Here's a recommendation for the voles: a rental pack of terriers. I love it. <laughs> oh, and I did. I, I saw that the uh, folks from uh, Fourth Corner Nurseries up here in Bellingham, where I'm from. I should have started there. Uh, they also uh, contract out sedge mat growth for everybody on the phone. We have tried putting up the big um, tees for uh, bird of prey posts mm -hmm. to keep mm -hmm. down voles, but I haven't noticed that it's um, been helpful or not. We've also, we were talking in the chats and people were talking about the paint with the sand on it to keep the beavers down. And we've tried that and we found that that didn't really work as well. I don't know if other people have had different experiences. Mm-hmm. Brenda, you were talking about your companion planting. Do you want to? Oh, that? that's the other thing we do to keep, um, well, elk off of our plants is plant a cedar in the same hole. We mostly use it, or plant a spruce in the same hole. We mostly use it for cedars, but I don't see why it wouldn't work for willows and other things as well. And that seems to be working at our site, Brenda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you that also up. had yeah. an 80% reduction in browse in our test plots. And I see oh. someone, Bernie has used bamboo sticks. I mean, the other nice thing about, about the bamboo sticks is it probably helps with the human error of accidentally weed whacking your 
um, installed plants in your field of reed canary grass? 